So we uh, go to the slides. Uh, first, I want to set something very clear on the terminology so that everyone understands alveolar and uvular. So alveolar is front in the mouth, and uvular is like these French guys. Uh, uh, so let's be clear about that. There are no misunderstandings. And uh, special thanks, uh, I do this together, uh, this presentation with my colleague Didier uh, Demolin from Paris. Uh, and special thanks to Roland van Hout, my former supervisor, with whom I got this interest in R and started a series even of conferences on R. Evi Tops, who was uh, one of my PhD students, and I will present a lot of her work, and Kun Seebrecht, another one of my PhD students. So I present here uh, about 25 years of research, and I hope I will continue for at least another 20 years with this fascinating sound. So I first tell you why I'm interested in R, then some insights and puzzling questions about the change from alveolar to uvular trills and other variants. And then I will plea for a multidisciplinary approach and show you how it works. I will start from dialectology. I will add variationist social linguistics, a little bit of phonology, and then phonetics uh, to solve some of the puzzling questions uh, uh, and raise more questions. And then we come to a conclusion. So why study R? Well, it's extremely variable in Dutch for both manner and place of articulation. And we have more than 20 variants, so we do much better than Basque. It's the most variable uh, uh, phoneme, but also in many other languages. Once people start studying it, they find 10, 12, 15 variants, Brazilian, Portuguese, French, German, and as we just could hear, also in Basque. It's often a carrier of variation. It shows a lot of social linguistic variation. It's a social linguistic variable, and it has a strong influence on preceding vowels. It often length lengthens them, blocks diphthongization, it colors the vowels in all kinds of ways, and it plays often a role in sound change. And of course, there is the relationship with R. This is not an elephant, but an elephant. By the way, made by a Basque artist and bought earlier this week in Donostia. And R is, in lots of languages, the last sound acquired by children. So it's an ideal variable uh, to study all kinds of complex mechanisms in language variation and change from very multiple perspectives. So alveolars are by far the most frequent realizations in languages of the world. In fact, Europe is a kind of uvular R island. And it's not so per, uh, surprising, in fact, because 80% of the consonants in the world's languages are always also found in the front velar area, uh, and only a small percentage in this uvular and further back area. So the Dutch variability is not exceptional and interesting, and that shocks phoneticians and especially phonologists, uh, they do not share an articulatory or acoustic property. That's not one thing that unites all these arts. Uh, and a fascinating quote by Ledefoget and uh, Madison in their book on the world's languages, the overall unity of the group of rotics seems to rest mostly on the historical connections between these subgroups and on the choice of the letter R to represent them all. My goodness, is that only that we can do as linguists uh, about this sound? Linda did an attempt to link some of the variants. Uh, she had uh, seven of these based on, among others, Dutch, Swedish, German, and African languages. And she introduced the concept of family resemblance. Uh, in fact, 
all air variants, you can link one with the other and another one with another one. Uh, so it's all a family, uh, but you can't uh, point out, oh, uh, for some of them, that it's also the brother of the other. Uh, no, uh, there's resemblances, but not real direct connections. And in fact, the shift from alveolar uh, r, uh, to uvular r, uh, the only thing she can point out here, here is that these trills that they share pulses, rapid pulses. Uh, that's what they have in common. But this does not provide an explanation uh, for a change from an alveolar trill to a uvular trill. This is one of the most famous dialect maps. It's about R in Chambers and Trudgill's uh, textbook and showing the spread of uvular R in Flanders. Uh, we see, uh, or in Flanders, in U uh, Western Europe. So a lot of it in France, but also in Germany, uh, in Belgium, even in Sweden, uh, Denmark. Uh, we find uvular R's everywhere almost, and there are lots of uh, mixed zones. These shifts from alveolar to uvular are very often uh, linked with contact, language contact with French, but there are also a lot of independent developments from French. For instance, German had uvular R before they even had uvular R in Paris, uh, because it's even in French, it's quite recent, 17th century more or less. What we also observe is that uh, by the end of the 20th century, there is a massive and rapid shift from alveolar to uvular realizations uh, in uh, Flanders. Before, uh, this sound was considered as non-standard, and if you had it, so people from my generation even were sent to a speech therapist well, because they had a speech deficit. So this is the Dutch language area and we will mainly focus today here on Flanders. And Leeuwarden is up north there uh, in Friesland, but I originate from Flanders. Uh, and the first source I will introduce you is the Reeks Nederlandse Dialect Atlassen, R and D, a series of dialect atlases of Dutch. Data collection between 1922 and 53, yes, it took a long time. Publication between 25 and 62. In total, 1,956 localities for the whole Dutch language area, so also in the Netherlands and in the north of France. They had to translate uh, 141 sentences, in total more than 4,000 uh, informants. Uh, and uh, these variants, uh, so these sentences, they were transcribed on the spot. They didn't have a recorder. And for R, they distinguished two variants, R met tongpunt trillingen, so that's an alveolar trill, and the other one was Gebrouwder, bird R. It's not precisely described, but it refers to all kinds of uvular realizations. And we will focus now on 859 localities that are currently in the Flemish community and in the Brussels capital region in Belgium. And we select three words from these uh, 141 sentences words that do not show lexical variation. Um, of the 800 plus localities, 93% have alveolar R and only 6.5 uvular R. So dominant alveolar. And for only two dialects, there is a remark about local variation. So it seems to be very constant in each of these villages. And here you can see the areas in dark, uh, the black spots are the uvular zones. So you see it here in the east, and part Limburg. You see here uh, some uh, uvular, this is also at the border with French. Here you have Brussels, bilingual city, dominant French. There you have uvular R. And also here's some spots at the language border again. 
and they're close to the French border, again, another place. So these are the places where you had these uvula are. Second, uh, we can skip that one, I told you already. Second source is a, uh, the GTRP, the project done in the early 90s, and that was the basis for the phonological and morphological atlas of Dutch. More than 600 uh, localities, so much less than the first source. Uh, about almost 2,000 items, mainly words, word groups, and a couple of phrases. And also here, in most cases, one informant per locality. Um, le a bit less than 200 localities in Flanders. Data, data were mainly collected, recorded, and transcribed by two persons. So there's consistency uh, at the transcription level. And they distinguished three variants, alveolar, uvular, and deleted R. So completed deletion of R. It's something that occurs quite often in Dutch dialects. And we selected now not three words, but 161 words that contained an R. Uh, 88% of these dialects only have alveolar R. Almost 7% only uvular R, and about 5% of the dialects, so that's only one out of 20 dialects, is mixed. Uh, uh, and also, these mixed ones are mainly uvular R with every now and then an alveolar. Uh, probably through to pressures uh, because p people were sent to a speech therapist to learn this alveolar one and everyone and uh, now and then it uh, pops up. So now we collected index scores and these are in fact the results. Uh, so a much less dense network. You, again, you see here the uvular region in the east. Oh, uh, it comes back. Some spots, but not that much, close to the language border with French. And here, the city of Ghent, Uvler R. And there, it comes from French. Um, so you see here again, it's partly language contact with French, but you still have also this old Eastern Limburgian zone, in fact, coming from Cologne, uh, uh, Köln, uh, um, Brussels was unfortunately not included in this sample, so we can't say anything about Brussels. So then let's turn to variationist social linguistics, departing from the idea that the speech community is heterogeneous. So this is, and the R sound is often seen as a chameleon. So this is the cover of Evie Top's dissertation. And we use their rapid anonymous surveys, a bit like Lebov's department stores uh, 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 interviews, but we recorded uh, things to get insight in the geographical distribution, so social linguist who does geography, dialectology, of alveolar and uvular R, with special focus on uh, variation within the localities. Two phases, first 39 localities, and on the basis of the variation pattern, we expanded them with another 50 localities in areas where we found variation, of course. We approached uh, people on walking on the street or who were in shops and asked whether they uh, wanted to um, participate in our study. Uh, and we said that it was a study on voice quality. That was the guise we used. Participants we selected uh, were only people who grew up in the village and who lived there. We recorded the speech and we had a word list task with cards uh, and within these 20 items there were 12 R words. 20 informants per locality. So in total, 1,912 participants and more than 22,000 tokens of R were analyzed and 12 variants we distinguished here. In general, 
results. Speakers do not mix uvular and alveolar. You are one or the other. You vary a lot for manner of articulation, but not for place of articulation. And the mixed speakers, only 5%, they show up everywhere. Uh, so they are not linked to specific zones. You can cluster uh, the variants on the basis of uh, combinations. Uh, uh, and here you see again, uh, this is the uvular zone confirmation of the dialect study. Now we here have a lot around the Ghent area, an expansion zone of uvular R. And interesting, there are two types of combinations with alveolars and uh, uvulars. And they seem to be, uh, here is a kind of mixed zone where you have the trill and uvul uh, uvulars, and then you have uh, the yellow one, which is reduced alveolars and uvulars together. So that's quite interesting phenomenon, but we won't go further into uh, that one. Let's look at the age factor. These are the index scores for the 89 places. If it's above the diagonal line, it means that the young speakers are more advanced in uvularization than the old speakers. So the age effect is very clear. Uh, it are the young who do the uvulars. So this is when you um, split them up now, the data for the age groups. This are, is the old age group, mean age 54. Uh, uh, and the darker the color, the more uvular. Now we look at the young speakers, and you will see it becomes much darker. Uh, the expansion is clear uh, also from a geographical point of view. And there are some interesting areas for time reasons. I won't go into detail. So uh, um, let's go to the combination of both data. And I just show you the results of the four different studies. Uh, the old dialect atlas, the moderner one, then our rapid anonymous survey, old speakers, and than the young speakers. Uh, and uh, you have a coverage of about 80 years in real time on their dates of birth. Now, so this is the old one. Uh, so here is the border. So this is in black. You have the old uvular zone. Now we add the second data set. And you see it a little, uh, you see it expanding. Yes, now the third data set, it expands more, and the fourth data set, spectacular uh, uh, what happens now. So that's how you can combine uh, both. Uh, so rapid change, massive geographical expansion in different zones, partly a revitalization of a very old area, Contact with French is an uh, origin, but also completely new areas uh, rise. Limited individual mixing and uh, a lot of uh, variation in manner of articulation, but I didn't show that. Now, phonologists look at these different, uh, 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 all these variants, how can we match them? And a question we have, in fact, is also reduction of alveolar R a path to uvularization. And this is the work by Kuhn Seebrechts. He did a quantitative study of R in four Flemish and six Dutch urban centers. And he also used the data of the atlases and tops and all kinds of studies. And he comes up, well, we saw Lindell's model. So this is Seebrechts' model of the relationship between the 22 variants of R in Dutch. But also, he has this problem on top. The he can explain everything, uh, all the relationships, the family relations between the variants. It's mainly a lenition process with its origin in casual speech. But the shift from front to back remains a puzzle. He says, yeah, it might be the perceptual relation, uh, the trills or other things for the reduced variant. And he says the origin is in acquisition. 
uh, more. Let's skip uh, that one. Uh, and uh, so let's now turn to phonetics. And I will come with a first attempt to explain the change from alveolar to uvular uh, trill. And that's the work here with uh, Didier. Uh, as an articulatory process with acoustic and perceptual uh, consequences. And we have to return to uh, quantal theory uh, by uh, Stevens, so 1972. We go back far in time. We like old things. Once a dialectologist, always uh, a dialectologist. And in old stuff, in fact, we found the clue. People haven't seen it at that time. Also, people who studied for over the past 50 years also haven't seen it. But the solution is already in work from the 1960s, Eve. What's quantal theory? It says, in fact, that changes in but in articulatory position in your mouth gives changes in the acoustic signal, but there is not a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, it depends on a particular region of the vocal tract, uh, and especially in the front part, uh, the, the subtle variation patterns have much more influence. Uh, and um, uh, the human speech production system is constructed in such a way, in fact, that the sounds it can generate and the articulatory attributes that produce these sounds uh, define a set of quantal states. Uh, and what are these quantal states? In fact, uh, the listener di extracts discrete information from a continuous flow of articulatory movements and pressure flow modulation. It's physics. Human beings are perceptually sensitive to specific thresholds in pressure and flow uh, and their acoustic co consequences. Uh, some things we can hear and others we don't hear. And there are zones of acoustic instability uh, also due to the coupling of other parts uh, of, the vo uh, of the coupling of our vocal tract with the nasal tract or with the tracheal tubes. And these quantal relation, uh, re, uh, relations, in fact, that's arri they arise from physical uh, principles. And this is an ultrasound of different R's. R1 is an alveolar trill, where, uh, and the back of the tongue is at the left-hand side, so here is the back at the red arrow, and the tip is at the dark blue arrow. So there, the tip touches the roof of the mouth. Position two, the tongue tip uh, is reduced, in fact, it's lowered. Uh, and when your tongue is thrilling, it moves like this. Yeah? Uh, and in R3, it's even further lowered. Uh, it's the third image. And also, the tongue blade starts lowering. And at the right-hand side, we have a uvular R. Now, Especially when you, but you have to compare the red arrow. There is the tongue dorsum. So the back of the tongue is, when you look, and especially when you compare R2 with this one, the position of the tongue is almost exactly the same at that moment. In fact, the position of alveolar R uh, is partly uh, the same as a uvular one. And there is the crux for understanding what happens. Then we have to go to Fund uh, in 1960, who made a simulation on how the formant values change. And so you have F1, F2, F3, F4, F5. This is where the constriction is. Front at the lips and back at the glottis. So this is quite complicated. But what do you have with um, front, so post-alveolar realizations? You see, and there's a little arrow, that F3 and F4 are very close to each other. So you have a pole of two formants there. And that gives the impression, hey, it's front. Uh, and if you have a pole with F1 and F2, it's, it's back. Now, what happens, and it's very difficult to see, I think, from the back, but there are always three lines. 
what happens when you reduce the sound, when you weaken it, when you lower the tongue? In fact, the pole disappears. There's no longer a pole of two formants. So if you have a weakening of your alveolar R, these poles F3, F4 disappear, or F2, F3 disappears, and you keep the back pole. And that gives an acoustic impression of a uvular sound. That's what we think, what is the case? Now, I will skip this one. That's another articulary thing that you need for having a good trill, but it's not crucial uh, uh, here uh, because we have to finish. Um, so this is just a model. So what are the next steps? Uh, we have to do an articulatory study of different variants of uvular and alveolar trill uh, as a possible explanation uh, for resistance to uvular uh, realizations in some areas because they are still very homogeneous alveolar trill areas. And I suspect that they have a different alveolar there than in the areas where the uvular one is spreading. We should definitely look at the role of individual bilingualism. Uh, and that's also one of the reasons why collaboration with other bilingual areas becomes very interesting. We have to make a speech synthesis, and we are working on that at the moment, of the articulatory and acoustic path from alveolar to the uvular trill, and these artificial stimuli we will use in perception studies, testing our theoretical explanation. Well, so, and hopefully we are right, of course, uh, that uh, can do. Another one is that we are uh, doing simulations uh, of spread, but let's skip that. So, conclusion, it's a vigorous, fast, uh, and in space change in progress of alveolar to uvular R, and we could get grip of it thanks to social linguistics and dialectology. The origin is partly French, that's social linguistics, revitalization of old patterns, there comes dialectology uh, helping me, it's an internal change, then we need to turn to phonetics and phonology, uh, 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 and we came with a new articulatory explanation. Now, my final conclusion. A dialect atlas is a crucial store for, uh, source for the study of language variation and change in Basque and of the underlining general principles of language change. Uh, it gives insight in geographical patterns, but it points out interesting variation patterns on the phonetic, phonological, morphological, syntactic, lexical uh, level. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it will give you uh, the material to select interesting linguistic variables for further research, also across disciplines and subdisciplines. So uh, I think we need to invest more in both dialectology itself and in the interdisciplinary study of geographical variation. And if you got fascinated by our COM 7 and 8 November to Paris for Erratics uh, 6. Thank you. <laughs>